kind of Passover to say the least uh, I remember right when we sat down Philip leaned over to me and he whispers hey Thomas I feel like something special is going to happen tonight <laughs> I looked at him I said I doubt it I was wrong <laughs> Jesus got up from the table he, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel and I remember at the time thinking to myself what's Jesus doing with the foot water no, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence? Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. He said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray.
there's no one beside you forever the hope in Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with them and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, and I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces forget about the rest the one that I kiss on the cheek that's the one you want a kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend uh, and then it, it got crazy uh, Peter <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear and Jesus Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. Thank you. 
crucified Jesus it's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got and personally I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that but I was just a soldier doing my job when the governor gave his sentence that's when I would go to work I loved that job I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree but that man that man didn't deserve that didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd, and they, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute, I, I am a man marked for death, and then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. 
What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then he died. Surely. This man was the son of God. Stand up. Jesus, just to enter into that story again tonight, thank you seems insufficient an expression. We're so grateful that what we gather to remember tonight, that you would willingly give of your life for us. And so we just open our hearts now as we 
enter a little more deeply into that story that you would meet us. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy of all the attention, glory, honor, majesty, power that's given to your name. And we give it you to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, tonight is about surrender. And at the end of the message, um, I want to invite you to come as part of preparation to the communion table. You're going to come and there's rocks all around the front stage at the communion tables and there's Sharpie pens. And I just want to give you some time between now and this moment to be thinking about what I'd like to call tonight our personal rock of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is Jesus' place of surrender. Gethsemane is the place where he said, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And Gethsemane, I uh, want us to represent tonight, where is that contact point in your life tonight of surrender, where you hear Jesus tapping on your heart and say, hey, trust me with this. And at the end of the message, I would like you to write that this right here on the rock, face of the rock. You're going to write, it could be a name, situation, circumstance, uncertainty, could be an image. Kids, all in the room, this is going to be a good opportunity. Kids, I'd like everybody, children, students, adults, everybody gets a rock. Everybody writes something on that rock that represents your personal place of surrender tonight. And then we're going to take that to the communion table. Because Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, there were some pretty amazing words that were shared in Matthew 26. They'll be up here on the screen. Here, here's a statement of Jesus this night. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. That's what the guys in the video were referring to. Watch, pray, they were saying. I need your help. And then going a little farther, Jesus falls with his face to the ground and he prays. My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So we're going to look at three things from this text tonight. We're going to look at the agony of Jesus, the wrath of the father, and the companion for our deepest valleys and darkest days. The agony, the wrath, and the companion. The agony of Jesus can quickly be overlooked and read through in this text, but to think that the Savior of the world came to a place where he would say he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, it's a way of him saying, what I'm feeling right now is so intense that the feelings I'm going through are literally killing me. Sometimes the experiences you have in life leave you in a place where the experience itself feels like you're going to die. That's Gethsemane. The Gospel of Mark puts these words to it. it Jesus is described as deeply distressed and troubled. <laughs> Not unlike, I think, many of you and maybe what you walked in here tonight with. Perhaps deeply distressed, troubled, and overwhelmed is a representation of your Good Friday 2023. Maybe you're here overwhelmed with the loss of a loved one, going through a sequence of grief and loss, and you, the, just the journey itself feels like it's draining the life away from you. Maybe you're overwhelmed with the loss of a marriage, the loss of a friendship. Maybe you're overwhelmed with the loss of your health. Maybe overwhelmed with the loss of what used to be. Some of you feel like Gethsemane is your new personal hometown. Like you've set up camp, you've built a home, and you've got a street address, and it's in Gethsemane. Because it just seems like one wave of sorrow and suffering after another. And tonight, what I'd like you to see is tonight we remember that our God, our Messiah, our Savior, our King, He knows, church, He knows about agony. He knows what it means to get to the point where He's not sure how He's exactly going to take the next step, and the next breath. That's our Jesus. Which begs the question, like, what is exactly he's encountering here that's bringing him to this brink of such distress and sorrow and overwhelming state? 
It has to be something more than just the physical brutality that he's enduring. It has to be just more than the physical ending of his life. Say, so why do I say that? Because many followers of Jesus have given of their life for their stance in Christ. And their testimony at the end of their physical life isn't one of being overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Their testimony is much more filled with peace and confidence and hope. There's something else going on here. Like when you look at a, one of the earliest martyrs of the church of Jesus, a man named Polycarp. Here's a picture of Polycarp, a statue that's been made of him. He was born in 69 AD, just 36 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And he was the bishop of an area called Smyrna, which is a modern-day Turkey. And he actually spent several years in his latter years in Ephesus. We've been studying the book of Ephesians. Well, Polycarp was a key figure in Ephesus in the early church. He was a disciple of the apostle John. And so Polycarp, in the year 155, he's 86 years old, and basically they tell him, you got to deny Christ pay your, basically bow your knee to Caesar or you're going to get burned at the stake. And he said, well, arrest me now, burn me now, because that, that decision's been made long ago. So he's being escorted into the arena where the crowd gathers and where they like to watch the Christians get executed. And so the police officer, like the lead officer, says to Polycarp on the way in, he says, one last time, he says, what harm is there, Polycarp, in saying Lord Caesar and offering sacrifice and saving yourself from death? And here's what Polycarp said, 86 years I've served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And they said the crowd went into a frenzy. They started chanting, and they gathered the wood, and they strapped Polycarp to the stake, and they tied his hands, and they struck the fire and lit the match, and they said the fire just consumed and engulfed. They just stood and cheered and chanted and screamed as Polycarp's body was engulfed in flames. And those who were the closest witnesses around him said that what stood out to them the most was not only the countenance on his face, which seemed to be one filled with great peace, but they said the scent of the burning was not the scent of burning flesh, but it was the sense of an incense of an offering. And there's those kinds of stories all through the history of the church that when Jesus comes to the end of his life, if his followers were experiencing a sense of peace and a sense of hope, why is it he's enduring to the place that he's overwhelmed with sorrow? Church, there's got to be more going on here, and I think the more going on is represented in the text with the word cup. Did you notice that when he asked for the cup to be removed? The cup is a long history of... For the Hebrews, cup represented the wrath of God. It was a metaphor for wrath. And so from the agony of Jesus to the wrath of the Father, we're seeing in this text. The wrath, Habakkuk 2 says it this way, the cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. Isaiah 51 says, you will drink the cup of his fury and you will stagger. So Jesus in Gethsemane, here's what he, he begins to experience a measure of God's wrath upon the evil of this world. And he's experiencing it in Gethsemane to the point where it causes him to stagger. His knees buckle because the taste is actually bringing him to the end of himself. So it's really the agony of Jesus flowing out of the wrath of the Father. Now, I want you, sometimes wrath, right? You can think, well, wrath some like cosmic temper tantrum. That's not what wrath is. The wrath of God is this picture of a directed response of indignation for the evil and injustice and sin of the world. And you say, well, I don't want a wrathful God. I want a loving God. To which God would say, well, you can't, they come together. Because when you love something deeply, when that which you love is violated and harmed, what's the appropriate response? A wrathful response from those who are loved. And so God's saying in his wrath, he's, he's, his love is displayed in his response to the injustice and violation and evil and sin that's taking place in the world. And Jesus is bearing the full brunt of it. That's why a wrathful anger is a reflection of of a depth of love. That's why Psalm 145 says it this way. It says, God loves all that he has made. And when what he's made is violated and abused, out of the depths of his love, he responds with wrath. So you can't have a loving God 
without a wrathful God because of the depth of evil and sin and brokenness and injustice in the world. And so here's Jesus in Gethsemane. He pulls the veil of the curtain back. And I want you to see this, church, that you get to see the height and the breadth and the depth of his love for you by taking the cup of God's wrath, the full measure of it, and drinking it to the last drop. That's what's going on that's far more than the physical endurance of the brutality of his execution. That's what's bringing him to the end of himself. Where he says, I don't know, Father, if I can continue on. It's not just the physical execution. It's this bearing the weight of the wrath of God on the sin of the world. That's what we need to feel tonight is the agony of Jesus and the wrath of the Father because it helps us flow into now this companion that we have. The scriptures call him our suffering servant rooted in this reality. Because in verse 39, when he says, may this cup be taken from me, then he comes. This is his surrender point. This is yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, I'd like a plan B. I'd like an alternative, which this text always gives me great hope. If, if you've ever been there, I think how many times in my life I've just asked the Lord, Lord, isn't there, isn't there another option here? I mean, there's got to be another way. And if Jesus asks for a plan B, there's a pretty good chance we're going to come to those places in our own journey where we're going to ask the Lord for another option. And I want you to see here with Jesus that he, he loves into the suffering. He comes to the point of longing for another option and saying, but Lord, at the end of the day, not my will, but yours be done. And I want you to see in this that surrender then is this pathway to companionship. Surrender is the pathway to companionship. Because you see, the, the first human was named Adam, and he entered a garden. And he was told, hey, if he handles the tree in the garden well, he'll live. <laughs> and then Paul calls Jesus our second Adam. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that. And then he says, Jesus, you know, he, Jesus enters into a garden. It's like a second garden. And the God asks him to obey to a certain, a certain tree. And this tree happens to be a cross. See, the first Adam's told to obey the tree and he would live. The second Adam, Jesus is told to obey the tree and you're not going to live. It's actually going to cost you your life. You're going to die. But the first Adam failed and the second Adam, he fully surrendered in obedience to the will of the Father and that surrender would cost him his life. And you say, how in the world, why in the world would he do such a thing? Because hear this, because Jesus would rather lose his life than lose us. That's our Savior. He'd rather lose his life than lose us. That's tonight. And this is the single greatest display of love in the history of the world. That the infinite, perfect, matchless Son of God would willingly have his life come to an end in complete obedience to the will of the Father under the staggering weight of all that Gethsemane was, <laughs> he said, this is what Jesus said. Jesus' complete obedience marks this. He says, it means he took our curse and we get his blessing. That's what tonight's about. Here's how Tim Keller put it. The quote's here on the screen. On the cross, he takes the curse for our life, and when you receive him by faith, you get the blessing for his. That's the love you've been looking for all your life. That's why John 15 says it this way, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So tonight answers the question about the love you've been looking for all your life. Tonight answers that. It's a love that's refined in the fires of agony. It's a love that sweats drops of blood in Gethsemane. It's a love that staggers under the weight of the Father's wrath. It's a love that chooses surrender because Jesus would rather lose his life than lose us. And all that becomes the groundwork, church, for when we walk into our deepest valleys and darkest days. If you say yes to Jesus, you say yes to a companion who will be there. Sometimes in those places you feel so all alone, much like Jesus did in the garden. And tonight, the title Suffering Servant is given to our Savior to remind us when we come to those places, our own personal Gethsemanes, He will be there. I hear, I see, I know, I understand. You can trust me with this. 
And so worship team, why don't you come on back up and here's what we're going to do. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to pray, dismiss us too. We've got two tables on the side here that have rocks, markers, communion elements, and then all around the front here. We've spread it all out tonight so that way we can get a lot of folks in a lot of different places to take parents and love for you to involve the kids in this. So take the time you need. And I'd like for the first step of this to be, right, come to the front, take your rocks, grab a couple markers, spread out around the room, and then take some time and give some thought and prayer. What, what do you want to write on this rock? Where's your personal place of surrender? Where do you hear the voice of Jesus saying, trust me with this? Write it on there. Help the kids write theirs on there. And then grab the communion elements when you're up here. We've got communion elements here. If you need gluten-free, gluten-free options are only at the tables on the sides, okay? But then grab your communion elements, grab your rocks and your pens, find some space all around the room. And then when you're done, when you've written what you need to write here, use both sides of the rock if you need to. I mean, some of you got a whole lot of maybe words that represent that. Guess. Fill it up. And then I'd like you to hold the rock and I'd like you to hold the elements in each hand like this. And then I'd like you to reflect on this. I want you to think about how this becomes the power for this. Say, so how can I possibly release the grip, surrender, not my will, but yours be done? How can I yield? How, how can I get to that place? Well, not by our own strength and power. Here. If his, not my will, but yours be done, that's what this represents. And this power enables this surrender. And so I'm going to pray for us in a moment and dismiss us. The team will lead us through some music and some song in this. But I think this is a great opportunity for you as families. And if you've come as friends, group of friends, if you want some personal space, you can use the prayer benches if you'd like. But this is your time. And I think it would be a great opportunity for you to circle up as a family unit and have a little moment of a covenant moment to say, hey, our personal Gethsemane tonight, we choose surrender. And we choose trust. And we choose to believe this that Jesus is with us. I will be there. I hear you. I see you. I'll help you get through what you can't possibly see how you're going to get through. So let's stand together. Our communion tables are open to anyone who said yes to Jesus. You don't have to be a member here. You don't even have to be a regular attender here. But the scriptures are clear, you need to have said yes to Jesus. So maybe tonight you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you're joining us online, you say yes to Jesus for the first time. And it's just a point of surrender for you personally. Probably clarifies what you're maybe going to put on your rock. You might just put my life on the rock if it's tonight. And you just say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me for my sin. I confess it to you. Come, forgive me. I surrender to you. You can do that tonight. And then you can come and take communion for the first time. And then for the rest of you who said yes to that at some point in your journey, tonight's your night is an act of worship. Paul reminds us in Corinthians, when we come, we remember. That's what we do tonight. We look back and remember his body that was broken, his blood that was shed, and we do it as an act of worship to remember his sacrifice. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much as we hold these elements and we hold these rocks. We join you in Gethsemane now, and we choose surrender and trust. Grant us power by the Holy Spirit as we literally take the elements in, as we receive afresh the life of Christ through the power of the Spirit. We do so as an act of worship, and we ask for an extra measure of grace on everything we write on these rocks. You hold them in your hands. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please come. Front and tables.
that so well tonight. Thank you, team. Appreciate all of you. Uh, you're going to take your rocks with you. And I want you to place it somewhere that when you glance at it, you want, I want you to remember tonight that you made a decision tonight. You're choosing surrender. You're choosing trust. And sometimes that's like a, an hourly decision, right? Like, I feel like a God that I take it back and it just, I want you to place it somewhere here. No. Nope. This is my Gethsemane. And Jesus has this. And I choose it. And so I want to send you out tonight as the people of Gethsemane from Isaiah 53. Here's what it says. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Some of you have been crying out equally so with Jesus on the why and the how long and the where are you's. You've got a companion. You know, that's, that's the language of Jesus in Gethsemane. And then it says this. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And so, may the Jesus who is our suffering servant, may he send you forth as a people of Gethsemane tonight. That Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, that he'd be light in your darkness, hope in your despair, strength in your weakness. That you would hear him say to you, I see you, I know you, I love you, I'm with you. Trust me. Choose surrender. Go in his name.